So you're tired of drawing free body diagrams. It didn't used to be like this. Once upon a time, physics was cool and you played with magnets. But then, one day, your high school physics teacher introduced you to the free body diagram. At first, it's not too bad. You draw a square and a couple of arrows and you're done. But then they start adding triangles, and even circles, and at that point you know you're done for. And don't even get me started on 3D vectors and the right hand rule. Who knows how long it'll take before someone thinks you're flipping them off. So why do you have to draw all these diagrams? What you usually learn in a high school mechanics class is called Newtonian mechanics, because this guy invented it. The central idea of Newtonian mechanics is that F equals MA tells you how forces relate to motion. So if you know all the forces on a system at one point in time, then you will know how it moves in the next. And then we do this again and again and evolve the system over time. But that means we have to know the forces, and that means you have to draw free body diagrams, which nobody wants to do. In short, Newton has got to go. Enter dead white man number two, Joseph Louis Lagrange. He helped develop an alternate approach to mechanics that we call Lagrangian mechanics. If Newton's theory of gravity came from asking why apples fall, then Lagrange's formulation of mechanics would have come from a game of catch. If you throw a ball, it turns out it always takes the path of a certain parabola. We know this from Newton's laws, but why is it that this path, for example, wouldn't be possible? The goal of Lagrangian mechanics is to find the quote-unquote optimal path and find a principle which helps us determine which path is optimal. To do this, we will need a new mathematical tool called the calculus of variations. In order to understand the calculus of variations, you will need some basic calculus knowledge. You don't need to know how to compute derivatives or integrals, but you should understand how slopes and rates of change are related, as well as how integrals can be thought of as adding a lot of small pieces of something together. Understanding the mathematical notation used in calculus will also be helpful. The reason we need calculus of variations is to solve these optimal path problems, where we need to find some function that is optimal according to some rule. We will first give some examples and then look at why these problems aren't quite the same as the usual optimization problems in your calculus classes. Turns out these kinds of path optimization problems appear all over physics. One example is the catenary. Consider two poles on the side of a street. If you want to hang a chain between the tops of the two poles, what's the shape the chain will take if you let it hang down naturally? It turns out the chain hangs in a way that minimizes the total potential energy of the chain, subject to the constraints that the ends of the chain are at the top of the poles. This makes sense since gravity will want to pull the chain towards the ground as much as possible. And we can calculate the potential energy given by mgy of the chain by splitting it into a bunch of tiny pieces, calculating the potential energy of each small piece, and then adding it all up, which is an integral. Thus, we want to minimize the value of this integral. The details of what's going on inside the integral isn't too important right now, but a handout is linked in the description with the derivations and explanations for those who are interested. Another famous example is how light refracts and bends as it travels through different media. Fermat found that light will always take the path of least time. We know that time is equal to distance divided by speed and the speed of light only depends on what kind of material it is traveling through. Then, we can find out the time it takes light to travel through a given path by breaking it up into a bunch of small pieces, finding the time it takes to travel through each small piece, and then adding it back together, which is another integral. The path that minimizes this time will be the path that the light will actually take. But the simplest example, and the one we will be working with the most, is probably one of the oldest questions in geometry. What is the shortest path between two points? Obviously, what you want to minimize is the total length of the path, which you calculate by breaking the curve into a bunch of approximately straight little segments and adding their lengths together. To summarize, each problem was about finding some path or curve that was optimal, and the path was optimal if some value relating to the path, whether it be the potential energy or length, was minimized. We will do the same for mechanics, so we need to find out what quantity, when minimized, gives the path a particle will travel.
However, we first need to figure out how to minimize these quantities. Normally, we work with functions that take in a number and spit out another number. However, here, we are working with something called functionals, which take in a function itself, like a path between two points, and spits out a number, like the length of the path. What we want to do is to find the input function that minimizes the value of the functional. To see how we should approach this, let's see if we can draw an analogy with how we optimize regular functions. If we have a function f of x, we can always graph it on two axes. In this example, we can clearly see the function has a minimum here, and it's exactly the point where it goes from decreasing to increasing, which means the minimum point is exactly where the function stops changing. We can also see that the tangent line at this point must be flat. You might be tempted to apply the same idea to functionals, but it doesn't quite work. With this function, it makes sense to talk about rates of change with respect to this variable because it's a number. But with the functional, does it even make sense to talk about a rate of change with respect to a function? While it's possible to define such a thing, it's very tricky, so we will view the problem from a slightly different angle. Returning to this function, let's talk about what it means for the rate of change to be zero at a point. The derivative measures the instantaneous rate of change at a point, and we define it by calculating a rate of change over smaller and smaller intervals. Eventually, we find that this gives us a tangent line. This is why the derivative is called the best linear approximation. Another way to understand this is that at points very close to that point, the tangent line is a very good approximation for what the function looks like. And this makes sense because when you zoom in a lot, the function looks like a straight line. Let's take a certain point on the curve given by x comma f of x. We know that if we change x by delta x, then that will cause the value of the function to change by a certain amount. Let's call it delta f. However, if delta x is very, very small, then we can approximate delta f by how much it changed along the tangent line. If we pick the minimum point, the tangent line is flat and delta f is approximately zero. So another way of saying a function is minimized at a point is that moving the input by an infinitesimal amount should not change the value of the function. This is an idea we can apply to functionals. Assume for a moment that we have a precise definition of what it means to change a function. If a function f minimizes the value of the functional i of f, then that should mean that changing f by an infinitesimal amount should not change the value of i of f. Now we need to figure out what it means to quote unquote change a function. Clearly, when we say we want to change the function f, we mean that we want to stretch it in some way which we can do by adding another function, which we call delta f. We call this the variation. We use the lowercase delta here, and we call it a different name, but it works the same in essence. When we vary the input function by a certain amount, we also expect the functional to vary. However, the variation is a function itself. How do we exactly differentiate between a small and a large variation? And there are also infinitely many ways to stretch a function. So how do we exactly compare them? The solution is to simply attach a multiplier to the function. We define the variation delta f as epsilon times eta. The notation is just to make it clear that f and eta are functions, but epsilon is not. Eta is an arbitrary function that determines the shape of the stretching, but epsilon acts like a multiplier that determines how much stretching or how close to the original function the varied function is. At large epsilon, the varied function will be stressed very far from the original function, and at small epsilon, the varied function will be closer to the original function. And when epsilon equals zero, delta f equals zero, and we get the original function back. There might still be a problem you are thinking of. Consider the following two varied functions. We choose the same epsilon, but two different etas. Obviously the first one looks more stretched than the second one, even though they have the same value of epsilon. It seems like this isn't consistent with how we wanted epsilon to be a measure of how stretched the function is. However, recall that we only care about what happens when we vary the input function by infinitesimal amounts, aka when epsilon is very, very small. In this case, all the stretched functions will look very close to the original function no matter what the eta is. To sum up, 
We figured out that a functional is minimized by a function if varying the function by an infinitesimal amount does not change the value of the functional, aka the variation of the functional is zero. We also figured out how to define the variation in a way that lets us talk about a small variation versus a large variation, at least in a broad sense. Now we need to actually figure out how to calculate the variation of the functional as we vary the input function. Before, we had trouble with this because we didn't know how to define a rate of change with respect to a function. However, since we have defined the variation in terms of epsilon, we can utilize the calculus tools we already have. Varying a function by a very small amount is equivalent to having a very small but non-zero epsilon. How much does the value of the functional change when we do this? That's easy. Since epsilon is very small, we can just use a linear approximation. The variation in the value of the functional is approximately equal to the rate of change of the functional with respect to epsilon multiplied by epsilon, which is what causes the variation. In simpler words, change in output is approximately the rate of change times change in input. Remember, we want to minimize the functional, so we want the variation of the functional to be zero for infinitesimal variation in the input function. This requires this derivative to be zero. Now we finally have a concrete way to know whether a function minimizes a functional. One last thing before we move on. One question you may have is, if there are infinitely many ways to stretch the input function, shouldn't the rate of change of the functional depend on how you stretch the function, meaning it should depend on eta? The answer is yes. That's where we say the functional is minimized only if the derivative is zero for any arbitrary eta. Now this condition is annoying to deal with, because in addition to your functional, you have to introduce an epsilon and then make sure the derivative is zero for any possible eta. Turns out we can derive a better condition that is easier to use for what we want to do. Recall the beginning of the video where we looked at examples of problems that required finding some kind of optimal path. They all required the integrals of some functional to be minimized. The functional inside of this integral depends on three things, a variable, some function of that variable, and our goal is to find the optimal function, and the derivative of that function. Why only these three things? Well, it's just how it happens to work out. There are cases where the functional can depend on higher derivatives, but as we will see later, that will not be needed here. For this specific case, things are a lot nicer. It's just a lot of computation, so we will treat it like a black box. If you want to read about the specifics, check out the handout in the description. It turns out that requiring the variation of this integral to be zero reduces to this differential equation called the Euler-Lagrange equation. Yeah, Euler was involved with this. Any function that minimizes the integral must satisfy the Euler-Lagrange equation, and solving it will give us our desired function. This is the most important equation in Lagrangian mechanics. So wait, do we just replace complicated diagrams with complicated math? Well, yes and no. It's definitely a lot more abstract than f equals ma, but I ask that you trust me that this equation can do a lot more cool stuff than f equals ma. Of course, like I said at the beginning, you don't have to understand all the specific math. The goal is to be exposed to the topic. But before we get ahead of ourselves, remember that this is a physics video. We figured out how to solve path optimization problems with our new shiny Euler-Lagrange equation, but our ultimate goal is to see how it applies to mechanics. The question goes back to, what quantity should be minimized so that the Euler-Lagrange equation gives us the actual path a particle takes? Truthfully, this question could be its own video, but thankfully we have a shortcut. We want this Lagrangian formulation of mechanics to be equivalent to the Newtonian formulation. So basically we want f equals ma to hold and be equivalent to the Euler-Lagrange equation. Remember that black box we used earlier to derive the Euler-Lagrange equation? Turns out we can just shove f equals ma into the black box the other way, and that gives us our answer. In order to find the path a particle takes, we want to minimize the integral of the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. This is often called Hamilton's principle, named after this dude. We define the quantity inside the integral as a Lagrangian, which we plug into the Euler-Lagrange equation. For mechanics, we want to figure out how a particle travels as a function of time. Essentially, we want to know x of t. 
This is why you will often see the Euler Lagrange written in this way, where x dot means the time derivative of x. Plugging in the Lagrangian will then give us an equation in terms of x of t and its time derivatives, which we call the equation of motion, since we can solve it to find the path x of t. But this only gives us the equation of motion in one axis. What happens if the problem we're working with is in 2D or 3D? No problem, just write the Euler Lagrange equation for y of t and z of t as well, just like how you would with f equals ma. But wait, it gets even better. Before, every time you did circular motion, you would have to write f equals ma for the x and y axis, and then try to figure out which components were cosine and which components were sine. For Lagrangian mechanics, we can directly work in any coordinate system, so you can find the equation of motion for theta if needed. An example with a difference is very obvious is the double pendulum, which has a pendulum hanging from another. In Newtonian mechanics, you would have to deal with a bunch of trigonometry with different angles, and you have to deal with tension forces that end up cancelling out anyways. But in Lagrangian mechanics, you can directly apply the Euler-Lagrange equations to the two angles. However, computational utility isn't the reason why Lagrangian mechanics is so important in physics. There's a greater theoretical value to it. For example, have you ever thought about whether conservation of energy or conservation of momentum were just empirically true laws, in the sense that f equals ma is also empirically true, or that they could be derived from more fundamental principles? This very important female mathematician, Emmy Neuter, proved a theorem, called Neuter's theorem, which showed that each conservation law is associated with some sort of universal symmetry. For example, do you expect the laws of physics to be different where I am versus where you are? Obviously not. This is what we call translational invariance or symmetry. If we assume that, then the Euler-Lagrange equation tells us that the quantity called momentum must be conserved. Similarly, time symmetry, which means we expect physics to be the same at any point in time, implies conservation of energy. Rotational invariance, which means we expect the laws of physics to be the same no matter which direction we look, implies conservation of angular momentum. The fact that such fundamental laws could be derived from such simple assumptions was mind-blowing to me the first time I heard of it. Of course, it's hard to be convinced of this without seeing the math in action but that's exactly why you should take a course in classical mechanics. However, the useful of Lagrangian formalism extends far beyond classical mechanics, being used in fields such as quantum field theory and particle physics, just to name a few. So what's the moral of the story? I use your dislike of physics as an excuse to do more physics. Hopefully, even if you aren't planning to study physics as your major, this has piqued your interest in the subject, and maybe you might even consider taking some classes. Thanks for watching the video, and hopefully I'll be motivated to make these more often.